You see, I'm trying to convince my son to learn Mandarin and Chinese. And I'm bribing the brother. I'm telling you, I'm saying to you, if you do that, I'll give you 100 pounds for every month you learn it. Now you think I'm joking. Every book he reads, you get 10 pounds. Five goes in the bank because he loves trainers. I said, five goes in the bank. I said, Omar, that's another five towards your next set of trainers. Some people say, well, he should read because he loves it. You, you, you do that with your son. When my son tells you about Norman Vincent Peale, when he tells you about Peter Daniel, when he tells you about Zig Ziglar, when he tells you about Jim Rohn, when he tells you about Anthony Robbins and your son's telling me about Bino, I'm like, who won? <laughs> Come on, man, I'm telling you. We've got to get to this place where we validate our gifts and where we begin to engage with the global networks. What does this mean for us? We're telling people, yes, go and get your education, and so they should. The Association of Graduate Recruiters are saying, as everybody knows, there's no longer a job that's going to last you for a lifetime. Everything's going to be client-based. Everything's going to be short-term contracts. But we're training our people, particularly in church, not this church, but generally, we're training people to be employees, not to be entrepreneurs, not to take risk. We're training them, socializing them into risk aversion. And then we're expecting them to do the work of kings. So there's these big global trends that are taking place, that are challenging us to think differently and to be different. Brazil, Russia, India, China are going to replace Canada, going to replace France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the United States. A friend of mine, who is, uh, his name is Alan Smith, uh, we had a seminar called the National Leadership Summit. It was an invited seminar. And uh, when we have our seminar, um, it's coming up later, or early next year. Uh, we'll, we'll be inviting some of you here. We'll invite pastors as well. And it's a seminar that brings leaders, you know, very good leaders from all over the place. And last year, Alan Smith said this, we're in game-changing times when the rules are being rewritten on many fronts. What is about to come in the next decade is rooted in the responses to the financial crisis, but also in some seismic shifts which are going on in society, politics, faith, and the environment. We've got some big challenges going on. This week, the governor of the Bank of England, it's not as if he didn't know before, you know. You know, have you ever had a car crash? Or you, when you're having a car crash, you, can, you know you're going to have it before you have it. But you just can't do anything about it. This week, he said, this is going to be the worst economic experience that we've ever had. I mean, he didn't just get up on Wednesday morning and come to that conclusion. This is a trained economist. We've got to realize that there's some big shifts taking place. Now, what I want to say is this. Remember, we start with the five ontological questions about who am I? Then we talked about our belief window. And now we're saying there's some big shifts taking place in the world. I want to suggest to us that what is happening for a lot of us is that our identity is being challenged. And as a result of our identity being challenged, the things that we have in our spirits and in our minds, the passions we have to realize, are being severely undermined and challenged. Because you're saying, I want to be a millionaire, and the global economy is telling you, actually, everyone's going to get poorer. So you've got to try and ask the question, who do I believe? The economy, or do I believe what my passion tells me? Now, for all of us, we face this challenge. And we've got to take the challenge and rep, you know, take the bull by the horns and wrestle with it head on. Because if we don't, we're going to end up being less than, we, less than we ever wanted to be and never achieve the things that we thought that we would. So fundamentally, our identities are being challenged. Our identities that are located in culture, identities that are, loco that are located in our gender, identities that are located in class, identities that are located in geographical re 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 regions, all of these identities are being challenged. And for some of us, we've allowed what we will call a disclaimed identity to become an intrinsic part of who you are. I'm going to explain that because it went a bit quiet. Each of us have what we call claimed identities. This is who I am. It's an expression of a deep, intuitive sense of my personality and my character. 
But often, the social circumstances in which we live contradict that. I grew up on a housing estate with, uh, I lived with mice, rats. In the night, if you turn on the kitchen floor, it would move with cockroaches. The government paid for my school dinner. The government paid for my, um, my school uniform. I had one holiday when I was young. The government paid for that too. So I always say to people that I always make it a point to vote, to say thank you to the government for what they've done for me. But you see, I didn't claim that to be my identity. I grew up in a housing estate. It wasn't a very good housing estate, actually. It was positively bad. And everybody outside of that housing estate believed that everybody inside that housing estate would never achieve anything. And for a while, I began to believe them. So I became part of a sound system, Frontline International, which was a big sound system. I started off with Magnum Junior. Then I went to Young Nation. Then I went to Frontline, which was one of the biggest in the country. I thought that was as good as it was going to get. The disclaimed identity, the sense of who I was, the other people was placing on me, I had to resist that. Because my parents were articulating a different message to me. Because my dad had a stroke and so he couldn't work, so he didn't have money. But he said, look, David, one day you will be something. One day, this is just a journey. There's a light at the end of this. You and your brothers, one day, you will be successful. You would make a contribution to this world. I didn't believe it. Like I said, I got into a sound. We started beating up people, fighting, stealing. I had more disposable income than my parents. But there was this message inside of me saying, you are to disclaim the identity that's being superimposed on you, and you are to assert the intuitive sense of who you are so that everyone else can see. Now, we have got to do that as individuals. You have got to actively resist what people seek to place on you and facilitate who you actually are. Now, this is where your brain becomes fundamentally important. Because throughout the day, your brain is receiving billions of billions and billions of bits of information. Your brain is made up of neurons that constitute cells that fire through synaptic activities. And what happens, you know, you can fit 30,000 neurons on the tip of a pin. That tells you how many neurons we have in our brains. Your brain and my brain is constantly working all day long. That if your brain and my brain was to absorb and process all the information that we have at a conscious level, all of us will have a simultaneous breakdown because there will be too much information. So what your brain does and what my brain does is it deletes, it distorts, and it generalizes. It says, David, there's too much information coming this way. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete some of it, I'm going to distort some of it, I'm going to generalize some of it. Now that doesn't sound like much, but let me add another dimension to it. Your mind is made up of two components, the conscious and the unconscious. The conscious mind is 10%. The unconscious mind is 90%. The unconscious mind informs the conscious mind. And then as it informs the conscious mind, the conscious mind reinforces in the unconscious mind what the unconscious mind put to the conscious mind in the first place. Let me explain that. You feel that you're inadequate. Your unconscious mind feeds that to your conscious mind. Because your conscious mind accepts now that you're inadequate and you're thinking about it, it reinforces what's in your unconscious mind. And so this perpetual cycle of reinforcing negative thinking becomes a part and parcel of who we are. So how do we reverse that? We've got to be intentional in the way that we manage our minds. And the way that we do that is that we expose our minds to alternative forms and patterns of thinking that contradict the negative patterns of thinking that inform our conscious minds. I say to people, if you're not reading a book a week, you can call it what you want, I call it lazy. If you're not reading a book a week, one book a week, 
I've read three books on a weekend and still spent time with my family. People said to me, how? And I said to them, I went to bed early and I got up early. Because I needed to get the information so that I could process my thinking and change the way that I had and, and change my outlook. Some of us want to achieve great things but we're not thinking like great thinkers do. And we can't think like great thinkers do because we haven't inputted into our minds the kind of natural resources that great thinkers place into their minds. Psychologists say the mind moves towards the greatest thought that it carries at any one time. People laugh at me when I say this. I can talk and I can get on with people. You laugh at those two talents. They've got me into every senior building in this country. They've got me into places where people who you see on television and people want to go and see will say, David, this comment was made in Parliament. Would you like to come into Downing Street to have a conversation about this? Why? Because you can talk and because you can get on with people. One day we had 45 people in a room. If we were to pay for them to come in a room, we would have exceeded half a million pounds. They never even asked for a travel card reimbursement. Why? Because I could talk. And because I like people. I'm just saying, you've got to find out what your one talent is and deliver that with exceptional quality. And it will put you at a serious competitive advantage over and above most of the people that you meet. And let me say something. If you find that you have a talent, please don't just let people tell you you've got a good talent. Go and get it accredited with some sort of institution. I used to go to places and say, I'll give my little talk. They'll say to me, thank you, Pastor David, lovely speech. And they'll send me off with a prayer. So I decided to go to the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts at the University of London, do a public speaking course, take the examination. I came out with public speaking distinction, gold, top of the year. So the next time an organisation asks me to speak, I just put an extra zero. <laughs> you know why? Because my friends weren't telling me I was good. The London University was telling everyone else I could do the job. You need to get your talents accredited so that when you sit in front of an employer or prospective customer or client, they can see that your talent has been legitimized and been validated by an external agency and you're not suffering from delusions of adequacy like some of the people on X Factor. <laughs>